Since we're talking about sci-fi, uh, you know, we can elaborate on. I mean, I personally think that anthrobots or other synthetic uh, living biological tissues can, if you can scale them up, could even u- be used for um, like construction, like for actual mm. inhabitable structures. Mm. So I actually have a background in architecture. Um, and what really brought me into this field of... Mm-hmm, um, that's interesting. S- yeah, I mean, I recognize that um, in biology, there is this um, ability to embody, you know, um, self-construct with um, sort of this embodied morphogenetic code. And as Mike was talking about, the, it, this comes in layers. We're often sort of conditioned maybe from, you know, middle school biology classes to think about DNA as the rule book for everything. But what we're discovering um is that yes, genetic code is important, but there are additional layers. Um, you know, there's epigenetics or bioelectri- bioelectricity that together make up this morphogenetic code. And how can we edit this code to steer um, these um, cells into completely new architectures that never existed before? Whether to use it, um, either to use it in medicine, in these ways that we're talking about. Or again, since we're talking about sci-fi, I'm personally interested in scaling this up um, into building like self-constructing bricks. And then, you know, by using those bricks, can we build living architectures? Because, Uh um, you know, yeah, I mean, when you look at um, the, you know, global warming, like more than 40% of the CO2 released to the environment is coming from the construction industry, just trying to like build things. Yes, yes, Um, yeah. And that's using the knowledge that we have developed as humans for thousands of years in the field of architecture, civil engineering. But at the same time, when you look at nature, it's also able to build um, structures at at scale, like oak trees or um, a lot of, you know, like you see a whale and a biology can build, you know, large things um, without let alone releasing carbon, but by sucking carbon from the environment. So it's literally carbon negative, the exact opposite of what we are, um, doing as humans. Um, and now like in the, you know, 21st century, we are learning that that's actually also programmable. It's not set in stone. You're not Mm -hmm. limited to only what's evolved out there, but as a biologist, engineer, designer, you can actually edit nature and create new structures. So why not create structures that we can use to solve some of the other problems, um, like sustainable construction yeah. or even space exploration? I mean, right now it's real difficult to leave the planet um, because of the gravitational pull. So the more weight you have you know, aboard in your sk- spacecraft, the more you're being pulled back. You need to have larger rockets to get you out, but then those lo- rockets also uh, pull you down even more because of their weight and so, you know, um, intricate balance. And are you really going to put in a bunch of like dead weight, like bricks, um, you know, um, or concrete um, precursors to build in like outer space? Instead, ca- instead, can you just take a tube of engineered cells? that way nothing and then once you leave the gravitational pull you can just grow them up into new structures that you can use to you know build in um in outer space so if you look at a lot to medicine but i think there are applications in other fields too right that's super cool so gazem you don't know this but my background's in math and physics and i often wonder what would i do if i had to do it over and i had to choose something else what would i choose and i think it would be civil engineering Well, I often say this because I look at houses and how they're constructed and it looks the same as it's looked for the past few decades and it takes just as long. And I always think, man, I wish that that could be done much quicker. I'm also a germaphobe. So in addition to being (laughs) mathematical (laughs) physics, there's germaphobia and I'm a nerd. So Dragon Ball Z and Dragon Ball Z, I don't know if you know this show, but you have this little capsule you bring with you and then you throw it on the ground and it becomes a house or it becomes whatever. Yeah. So that's really the dream. (laughs) Yes. I like this idea of building a robot from smaller pieces. Also because like I'm a germaphobe and I want robots to clean washrooms. Because I just feel horrible for janitors. Mm -hmm. I feel like, oh my gosh, how do they do that? And they should be paid so much more. I wish a robot could just go and do that. And then a robot would deconstruct. Because then you'd wonder, how do you clean the robot? Yeah, (laughs) biodegrade. Yeah. So I hope that you could make some inroads there. 
Yeah, I mean, we have microphages that go down like Chase Factory and swallow it and degrade it. So we can maybe transfer the same principle to biobots. What's the lifespan or functional lifespan of the anthrobots that you've been studying? Uh, so, yeah. Um, so the, for them to build themselves, it's about two weeks. Um, and then for this, um, so we at the very beginning talked about uh, releasing them from the matrix and then having them sort of turn inside out that morphological reorganization that takes sort of another week or so. So three weeks is for their developmental, um, the developmental phase, which we now work, we're working on a follow up paper to characterize those stages more. But once it's a ad- sort of adult bot that is able to move around, um, we, there is a variability there. Um, we've seen them living from sort of month to multiple months. But what happens in every single case, um, if, you know, in their wild, if you're not like giving them different, um, drugs or anything in their wild type anthrobot case, what happens at the end of these multi month, um, period is every single time just degradation into individual cells. So, um, and, and to debris. So they're able to naturally biodegrade, um, which sort of helps with the concerns around, well, if you put them into body, then what's going to happen? Will they yeah. ever like, create clogs we ha- what we have seen in the lab is every single time they degrade into individual cells so then that's not going to be any different than the individual cells that your body disposes of now i understand you didn't genetically modify these but did you observe any other changes that were epigenetic or bioelectric uh we haven't looked at their bioelectricity as mike said that's like definitely one of the next things to look at because there's so much there and that was that concept concept was foreign to me until i came to mike's lab uh up until uh my phd i was doing a lot of actually genetic ed- editing synthetic circuits to change morphology and it was here that i'm realizing that there are all these other layers like the complete morphogenetic code so it, no that that's not something we've done yet but we would love to look at um but other epigen- epigenetic, so I mean, this whole thing um, that we talked at the beginning about character formation, right? So none, no two anthrobots are identical, but we have these morphotypes and behavioral classes that also happen to influence each other. Uh, so figures two, three, four in the paper. Um, I mean, that has got to be um, a result of some sort of epigenetic influence. Because again, every single anthrobot starts with the exact same DNA, but they end up in different um, sort of morphological flavors. One is fully covered with cilia, one sort of mm-hmm. morphotype. Another morphotype um, is fully polarized. So half of it is covered with cilia. The other half is bold. The third type is, um, again, cilia everywhere, but much more sparse, so like a checkerboard pattern. I mean, if all of these bots have started with the same DNA, what's causing this morphological you know, um, variability? Mm-hmm. And that has got to be epigenetics. Uh, we don't yet know uh, what those epigenetic knobs are. Uh, we have some supplementary um, da- data in the paper that um, discuss matrigel, the matrix viscosity as a potential factor or their um, initial you know, cell density. So that's sort of reminiscent of Angela's work, like based on how many cells we start with, the resulting um, answer about population profile is different. So those are the only two things we've looked at and we have since significant differences. So those seem to be like maybe one of the first couple knobs, but we still have a long way to understand what are the knobs and then uh, what's the underlying sort of mechanism that's right. making those knobs to be the ones that are influential. Yeah. One, one, one thing that I just wanted to add um, on top of that is that um, the original meaning of the word epigenetics was basically everything that's not the genome, right? So, so that includes bioelectricity, that right. So, so traditionally that would include biophysical factors, biomechanical factors, um, ionic factors, and so on. So, when we say, um, uh, at, at least when I say epigenetic, I don't just mean the chromatin modifications that people focus on today. You know, the mm-hmm. methylation, the acetylation, all that stuff, but actually all these other things. So, so we don't know. I mean, there could be, of course, there could be chromatin modification effects, but but we are, you know. The the next step is to, is to look at the uh, at the bioelectrics and and probably biomechanics too and other other um, aspects of the physiology of it. So there was a term gazem that was used, and Michael, I'd like you to explain it just for the audience to know. It was matrix 
and the term mm-hmm. escaping the matrix was used. And so <laughs> because we're dealing with people thinking you've cracked the code, you need to explain right. what's meant by that because people are going to think well, everyone here is 95 years old <laughs> and you just made yourselves look younger. That's right. It's the cosmic matrix. No, it's not the cosmic <laughs> matrix. It's, um, yeah. So, so, so cells uh, produce the stuff called extracellular matrix. And it's basically just a, uh, it's a collection of important molecules that sit on the outside of cells and between cells. And they, uh, they, it, it has all sorts of functions, including as a repository for information. So much like ants, um, leave, leave each other messages in their environment, right? And it's, it's a, thing called stigmergy when you can when you use the environment as a scratch pad so uh extracellular matrix in vivo is this kind of like um rich set of molecules that are hanging out between and outside of cells that can also be used as information and, and influence and so uh gives she could tell you more about the, the specifics of it but she but she's she's using a specific um matrix to support these cells in their journey to becoming an anthrobot <laughs> If you enjoyed that clip, then the full podcast is out right now. You can click around here. Enjoy. Subscribe to Theories of Everything to get notified of upcoming podcasts as there are new full-length podcasts every week on the topics of mathematics, physics, consciousness, free will, and AI.